Welcome to everyone. Welcome to EX. Welcome to the MIT uh, Enterprise Forum and guests. Um, uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm a director of engineering here, and I just want to say on behalf of Yext, uh, we're really excited to be hosting this event, uh, this uh, talk and, and discussion on data and data privacy uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, data is, is core to, to Yext's business, uh, being a knowledge engine and repository for structured data. Uh, at this point, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses trust us and rely on us to manage their location data and sync it everywhere it needs to go on the internet. We, in, in, in turn, then collect uh, performance data and, and analytics and do all sorts of analyses on it. Uh, so you could say that Yext is, or, uh, data is vital uh, to the business at Yext. And, and then secondly, um, we have quite a few uh, MIT alumni on the staff here at Yext, uh, many of whom are, are watching in the audience today, uh, and also, also including me. Uh, and I had the opportunity about almost 15 years ago to uh, work sort of indirectly for uh, one of the speakers today. So I'm also very excited to be here. Um, so uh, anyway, I think just to get started, I think I'm going to call up uh, the chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum. Um, she's a graduate of the MIT Media Lab herself, uh, Christina Dolan. Come on up. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you to Yext and Steve. Thanks for the intro. And um, Yext, thank you so much for this wonderful reception and for hosting us today. Um, so I've known uh, Sandy and Michael for longer than I care to admit. Um, but because uh, I was at the Media Lab, uh, gosh, over two decades ago. But um, and if I read out their entire bios, then like the whole time would be taken. So I'm going to be really quick. Um, so uh, Professor Sandy Pentland, he's one of the co-founders of the MIT Media Lab and holds a triple appointment. I mean, it's hard enough to have one appointment, but he has a triple appointment at MIT. Um, the Media Lab, School of Engineering, and School of Management, right? Is that correct? Did I leave one out? <laughs> and he also directs the MIT Connection Science Initiative, uh, the Human Dynamics Laboratory, and the MIT Media Lab's Entrepreneurship Program. He's been a member of the advisory boards at places like Google, Nissan, Telefonica, uh, and a variety of startup firms. And for uh, several years, he's co-led the World Economic Forum Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives. Um, so I could go on and on. He's ranked, you know, number seven, ten, one of the you know top uh, data scientists in the world. He's got these amazing projects that have been funded by you know the White House and the UN and the EU, and uh, he's um, a pioneer in blockchain technology. Uh, and uh, I could go on and on, but then we won't have time to uh, hear him speak. And Michael Schrag, who was. Uh, who is a research fellow at the MIT Sloan School, an uh, initiative on digital economy, um, does a lot of work in the area of innovation. Uh, his current focus is the design of network effects. And he has a current piece in the Sloan Management Review, which I suggest that you read, on multiple cells in the networked uh, workplace. He has a number of books, uh, Serious Play, uh, What Do You Want Your Customers to Become, and uh, The Innovator's Hypothesis, which drew on his work at the MIT Media Lab. So uh, I welcome them to the stage to begin. And uh, thank you very much. Hi. Uh, welcome here. Um, let me quickly give a uh, expectation management uh, prep. I think Sandy wants to set the stage and give some context to his work. And based on some of that and some of the research that I've done, we're going to talk for a certain period of time. But I would like to throw it open to questions from you sooner rather than later. So within the fifth, ideally within 15 to 20 minutes, we start integrating comments and questions from you into our conversation. And I hope that there's a microphone runner who will be handling that. And if not, I will do Phil, a Phil Donahue. Oh my gosh, this is an older crowd if they know what a Phil Donahue is. Um, but that's, that's basically it. I, I don't want us to be too constrained on the notion of big data and privacy because that really short shrifts not just the breadth of, of Sandy's work, both policy and research, but the, the notion that privacy or personal or self-control over data, there are, that's kind of now, these things live within a data ecosystem. That, that Sandy and his, his, both his companies and his researchers really have given a great deal of thought, some of it even rigorous thought, in terms of, <laughs> in, in, in terms of 
how, how that should, should be evolved based on current trajectories, current political concerns, and, and uh, uh, various factions that are really competing for success in the marketplace. So Sandy, if you wouldn't mind setting that up for us. Great. Is this working? Hello? You gotta push the button. There we are. Hello. Okay. Ah, the big voice. <clears throat> so I thought I would sort of just spend a moment and sort of introduce how I got sort of where I am today, not physically here, but mentally. Um, so the Media Lab helped create that and form that for many years now. Recently, we're setting up a new thing at MIT called the Institute for Data Systems and Society. So it's the institute within the institute, sort of typical MIT on <laughs> creative naming. Uh, but the idea is, is, is that um, by looking at things as networks and the new sort of mathematics and new sort of understandings we can get through data, we may be able to transform governance, health, power systems, you name it. Because all of those are designed really with the, the sort of social science and mathematics of the early 1800s, you know? Independent people not talking to each other, influencing each other, centralized systems, clearing of information. None of that's true, but those are the things that underlie the models of our society. So no wonder we get bubbles and bursts and stuff like that. That's the idea. I also, um, for the last 15 years, have, have had it as sort of as a personal mission um, to help birth the big data ecosystem. Not that I'm going to do it alone, but that I'm going to help. And, and the reason, I think, is said most eloquently in the thing that we did with the UN Secretary General a couple of years ago um, for the Sustainable Development Goals, the 15-year goals of the UN. Um, and those goals specified that uh, the UN and every country in the world would use these new data sources to measure poverty, health, pollution, sustainability, inequality, you name it. 170 different KPIs for the social health of every country on Earth. That's what got signed, okay? Now, it charged all the national statistical offices of the world with doing this, and they don't have a clue how to do it. But, you know, it's a start, and donors are beginning to demand that it happen. So we'll see. The reason that's important is because you don't reduce infant mortality, you don't reduce genocide, you don't reduce inequality unless you can measure it. That was the lesson of the first 15 years, the Millennium Development Goals. And of course, it's a general lesson. It's a step towards much greater transparency worldwide and much greater accountability. Now here in New York, we're at the creme de la creme. I mean, we're not even the 1% of the 1% worldwide. So, so the, the urgency of sort of having data is very different if you're in Rwanda than it is here, and some of the practical problems are different too. So there's a spectrum of needs, but, but the core thing is, is you need to trade utility and the advantage of knowing. And the title of the thing that we did for the Secretary General was A World That Counts. And the idea was that we should never, ever be able to say again that we didn't know when there's a Rwanda, when there's some sort of mass starvation or infectious disease outbreak. We should know. We should know what to do. We should not have the excuse that we didn't know. So, so that, of course, <laughs> has to be traded against security. You can imagine a big data world in Rwanda or Syria where the government would use it for genocide. Not so pretty, <laughs> okay? Uh, and then, of course, we have privacy. So all the 1984 visions uh, look sort of trivial in comparison to what could be done today. And so, so we need to somehow balance the good against the evil, against poor countries, against rich countries, in establishing the way forward to be able to harvest the value from this without getting the bad bits. Um, and that's what I do with people like AT&T and hopefully with Tencent, we'll find out. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, have students who've founded various uh, companies like Endor, which does sort of early warning systems. is a machine learning that uh, can catch trends very early, earlier than anything else, works for MasterCard, 
for uh, Pepsi, for intelligence agencies uh, around the world, Distilled Analytics, which does credit scoring for unbanked, uh, Thassos, which does uh, uh, sort of more fundamental financial data uh, that hopefully will make the world a little better place. Anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to say is that this trade-off, oh, and the one other thing, which is the title of this, I'm sorry, that, that, I've got on me for talking too much. The one other thing that we have is we're just launching a big uh, trial in three countries, Senegal, Colombia, uh, Andorra, and probably China, we just signed the agreement with China to try but, and make four. But who's counting? I know. Well, see, it's Doris only MIT. Right? It's three point. It's three point one four, <laughs> actually. But um, the idea is uh, an arrangement whereby private data from telcos, from other sorts of things, can be put into an open public repository in a safe way, and used for mobility, for health, for things like that as a way of kick-starting uh, a digital ecology. And I'd be happy to talk about it. It's called Open Algorithms. Somebody told me I should talk about that. So uh, there uh, we go. Right. We're definitely going to get to that. And you've given okay. a sufficient high-level answer that it sort of raises the question. You, Public-private partnerships, creating repositories. Clearly, the theme of governance is going to become, not that government, but data governance is going to become more important. But, but I'd sort of like to begin at the Davos level. We've been involved with Davos. You, you deal with people at both the technocrats and the, the, the politicians of it. What is it about data? What is it about analytics? What is it about the governance of data and analytics that the leaders you interact with year in and year out simply don't get or they decline to understand it as well as you think they can and should? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is, is you get these black and white reactions of, that's my data and you can't have it, or it's infinitely evil and you can't touch it or come in. No, these things are all trade-offs. You could have good, you could have bad. You need to build a system that encourages the good and discourages the bad. Also, there is a tendency to say, well, we don't really need to do anything. I can go to bed and wake up tomorrow morning, it'll be okay. But a lot of kids in the world won't wake up. <laughs> There's a lot of other things that won't happen unless we begin putting some of these systems in place. Well, in your work, you said it specifically, and I, I, I commend this, this is good nighttime reading in both meetings of the phrase, uh, to, your, to your attention. Very, very comprehensive, very wide-ranging, but one of the, the unsubtle points you make is the assumptions underlying privacy and data control and data governance for the EU, yes, Germany, I'm looking at you, right. and the United States are fundamentally different. They're on different trajectories. Clearly, privacy, I mean, in, when I was in Europe this week, I do a Google search, and there's a little notification at the bottom saying, everything you look for may not be here to honor Europe's you know, privacy rules. I, I don't want you, ex ideally, I'd like the way for you to answer this question would be, what happens if we continue on this current, they're, they're not parallel paths, they're polarizing paths. That's so, number one. And number two is, what kind of purchase do you get in trying to, bridge or create congruence between two very different regimes for data protection, privacy control? So um, I remember an interchange between the, the chief justice minister of the EU and the head of the Federal Trade Commission, who's sort of our chief privacy officer in a sense. Um, you know how, you know, we're, we disagree about this and that. But we agree about how to treat kids. So that's so start with minors. So, right. Okay? And then somebody, and I won't say who because you're not supposed to under Chatham House rules, pointed out that uh, if Europe had stronger laws than the U.S., the U.S. had to conform to the European rules eventually because so many of the Euro American companies do business in Europe and they can't afford to have two sets of rules. And that uh, used to be called Safe Harbor, and now it's called Safety Shield, and I was there when they were handling it out. And uh, 
So far, the U.S. has convinced the EU, with a little bit of arm twisting and some smoke and mirrors, that what we do is equivalent to what they do. I think that the real difference stems from the fact that the European system has roots in Napoleonic law. Mm -hmm. It's proactive. You try to imagine what's wrong and protect against it. The U.S. Uh, law tends to be you have to show me a concrete harm, not the potential of There's harm. less of a precautionary principle exactly. in U.S. law. Exactly. And so there's always going to be tension there until all the issues are resolved. But your, your point about children, I mean, my brother, in just a full disclosure, looks at Facebook. That really is a political pressure point. Mm -hmm. the potential for abuse of children, children or teens posting things that could haunt them forever. How do you see that? Do you see, uh, uh, to, to mix a horrible metaphor, do you see children as the camel's nose under the tent <laughs> for a more, <laughs> into, uh, yeah, yeah. whatever you do, don't attribute that one, uh, um, for, for extending a European sensibility based more on protecting individual privacy and data as opposed to the trade-off issue. Because one of the points that Sandy's research makes is if you really want to improve public health, if you really want to create early warning systems, you have to facilitate sharing and greater openness of data. And this is, this is the real crux point. So I'm, I'm trying to get you to articulate or lay out here how you are giving these different groups a vocabulary to negotiate these trade-offs? So the, the way it evolves is not terribly satisfactory, of nor course. is it fast. But the core issue has to do around informed consent, OK? It's a little legal phrase. And uh, there's a big divide between the US and the EU, but not around kids. In the U.S., who, by the way, are not allowed to give informed consent. <laughs> right, exactly. Ironic, isn't it? That's right, because they are presumably not competent in right. some relevant sense. So in Europe, people believe, uh, quite generally, that it's too complicated to give. Da data use, data uh, misuse is too complicated for a normal citizen to give informed consent for use of their data. In the U.S., it's a different attitude because we've had rules like that around loans right. and stuff for a long time, and we're more familiar with it, presumably. Um, and what's happening in Europe and beginning, I hope, to happen here is you're getting third parties that manage data for citizens. Think of co-ops. So, so agents, agents that can act on your behalf in a safe I won't say safe harbor, but in an informed consent. They're sort of like your right. informed consent agents, ICAs. Yep. So, so what you see in Europe is you see co-ops coming up. Here, the, the thing I think is actually really interesting is credit unions, which are a part of the law, that actually are supposed to provide you with identity documents and services. And very, it's like all there in the law, right? They're heavily regulated. They have to act in your interest, not their interest. In the case of credit unions, it's owned by the people who deposit money. So it's you, right? And that way you can get around this informed consent because you can have professionals who are doing the best Why job. Why do you use the phrase of getting around informed consent? I, I think you've actually identified a critical fault line here. The ontology, the future trajectory of informed consent is a big deal. In bioethics, yeah. informed consent. Same time. Future. And there's a convergence that there's credit for loans, but there's also informed consent for certain kinds of treatment or participation there's, there's or releasing whole, your data. Whole range of things. So what have you learned about informed consent that 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 other politicians or other people or companies don't appreciate or don't understand? What if you set up an informed consent consultancy, what would be the key piece of advice that you would be selling? Um, I think that's probably, well, OK, let me do this. So, so the, the, the core thing I would be selling to the, the participant is the problem with talking to an entrepreneur. We, we will, we will um, protect your data and derive value for it. You'll have better medical services, better this, better that. I don't think the money is the important thing. What you want is you want exactly the right medical treatment for your kid when you need it, right? That's, 
worth any amount of money, right? So, and you can get that by sharing data to the right people in aggregate, et cetera, et cetera. What has been missing is, and we were having a discussion about this earlier, is the economic incentive to set up those agencies for individuals. It's been difficult to get sort of the data market liquid enough and valuable enough that it's worth somebody setting up a business to help people to do it. But that's beginning to change. Is data, when you go for it, is the right metaphor for data an asset, a currency, What's the way you want, I mean, should there be like, bank, you talk about credit unions, is it, you, you know, it's, it's MBA, management by analogy. Yeah. What's, so, the, what's the regulatory or organizational analogy that you think is going to get? Well, currency is probably the best one. And, and the most destructive metaphor is, oh, data is free, information is free, you put it out there, it goes everywhere. But actually, that's what contracts are for. Contracts say, I will give this data to you. You can use it exactly for this and nothing else. Right. And you provide me this service in return. Right. That's why I give it to you. And when you're done with the service or if I withdraw it, you can't use it anymore. People say, oh, come on. They're just going to stick it out there. Well, that's the cause of a lawsuit. And that's where things like blockchain become interesting and smart contracts because now you can automate that contract so that I give you access to my location for right now, and I make sure via this bit of software that's auditable that you don't screw with it. <laughs> so this is at the point, I've not been to Davos, but sadly I talk to many people who do. This is the point at with the, the people, you know, the CP Snow thing, you know, the two cultures. This is the point when, when Sandy says blockchain, this is the point at which the lawyers say, uh, you technologists always are figuring out a technical solution, but it's really a policy and a legal issue. You're trying to weasel away from policy and law and try to solve the problem. You're, you're just throwing technology at the problem. Well, this is even worse. <laughs> what we're trying to do is replace law with technology. So, so here's repeat, the now. Repeat, wait, that, wait. repeat that, please. Repeat that, please. We're replacing law with technology. So here's the, here's the realization. Law oh, like that. is just algorithms. If this happens, do this and that thing, right? And it's executed by bureaucracies. And when it screws up, it's fixed by judges and cops. And if you think about all of those things, you realize just how pathetic an algorithmic execution fix-it system we have. And we could do better, but it doesn't have people in it. And that's scary. That rings I, I, INET, all that. Oh, they're taking over. Right? This is one of the boldest visions I've heard. But I've got to say to you that if you say to a lawyer, I, 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 the ratio of lawyers to engineers or other people in Congress and certainly the EU is what do you figure? 20 to 1? 30 to 1? 40 to 1? Sorry? Congress would be Congress Yeah. 500 to 0? Right, well, there's a doctor. Yeah. There's a con doctor. Well, no, actually, he's now been elevated to the cabinet. So, so this is my point. Yeah. When you say we're replacing law with technology, this will make lawyers not happy. Well, <laughs> an interesting little thing. I'm, I'm on the, the advisory board for the American Bar Association. Because they want to keep you on a short leash. That's right. <laughs> no, what, what, what they realize is, is that some of this stuff is coming, and they want to have a hand in how it happens. This is where open algorithms come in, incidentally. Please. OK? Elaborate on so, that, yes. So, so it's, a, it's a simple idea, which is, is that, you know, if you're going to be automating decisions based on data, it gets scary because where's the human factor? Where's the our feeling? Of what happens if they go wrong and do some crazy thing? So you have to put a human in the loop, okay? So the way you do that is you only allow certain algorithms that have been looked at and approved by a legislature-like body to be executed on the, on the data. National and Academy of Lawyers. Oh, wait. Yeah, Never. could be, could be, right? You know, and and that it gets the National Academy of Algorithmic Lawyers. Should you be teaching? 
Isn't it a pity that MIT doesn't have a law school? What do you, what, go, you can go to law.mit. <laughs> Yeah, is, no, seriously, it's there. No, no, no. I'm asking. A bunch of random questions. No, no, this is, a, but, 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 this is a very serious question. If, if, could you now, given, given the work that you've done and the research that you've done, and you do, have, you do have three appointments, MIT doesn't have a law school, but there is a, a relatively decent law school across the river. We've heard that, yeah. Yeah. Should, should there be, what would a course in algorithmic law look like? Well, um, we're actually putting together something like that there you go. for the ABA, right? And, and the idea is, is lawyers should understand what algorithms can and can't do and how you can keep them under control, right? Because that's actually one of the key things is how do you keep, this is actually sort of an issue of informed consent. How is the human informed about what's happening and consenting to the execution of this algorithm. And how does open algorithms So algorithm that, sets that. up sets up a framework whereby the algorithms are vetted continuously by humans. So it provides the data about what happened and what was the algorithm. And you know that the data isn't corrupted because of blockchain. And, <laughs> and also there's some other things that the EU likes. So the, this work is actually funded by the EU as a way of protecting privacy. Because they want to know that access to data is being controlled and, and data spreading is minimized. And that's what this does. What about black box algos, though? We keep hearing that algorithms come to decisions that... So know, there's two things about the, black, about the black box. So you know, it's just like, what's this thing doing? So first of all, you know, baby steps first. So the all, open algorithms thing, we're setting up at a country scale. The data is all only aggregate data. It's like census data, so it's not so dangerous, okay? Also, no black box things are allowed at first. But at it first. turns out there are ways of doing a pretty good job with black box. And they're simple. If you, take the, if you have the data and you have the decisions, you can ask, well, how much of this decision depends on, say, gender? How much of it depends on race? They're very straightforward ways to do that. You had a master's thesis on this. And then you can have the debate about whether this is something you want. And, and the reason you want to have that debate, I remember I was at Oxford and somebody was talking about how evil algorithms are. And this guy from Kenya got up and said, you talk about the bad things algorithms should do. You should come to Kenya and see what the judges do. <laughs> Dead on, right? We ought to do that for the humans, too, right? And ask, what are these guys doing, right? Is this legal system better or worse than what's being proposed? I, I, want, to ask a, I want to ask a technical follow-up to that, and then we'll go, we'll, we'll follow up this trend and go to the audience. Black box algorithms, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a nice euphemistic twist on black box. Deep learning algorithms. Ooh. Here they are. They, they have very interesting predictive validity, but they're, about, they're very opaque. It's very difficult to, under, to discern the inferential and causal chains within them. Is there, you're the trade-off guy here. It, do you think that this desire for open algorithms the benefits, the openness, the transparency of open algorithms and the accountability of open algorithms will militate against investment in deep learning algorithms precisely because they're less transparent, more opaque, and more difficult to discern. Maybe a small thing, but you know, things follow the money. That's, you know, <laughs> sorry. But, but the thing is, is like the black boxes, you can take the decisions made by deep learning and the data, and you can ask, how does it treat different genders? How does it treat different races? How does it treat different? And you can discover when it's growing up. So, you, so you're treating it like order. a black box. What? Right, then you're treating it like a black box. You're well, you're treating it like a black box. Well, it is a black box. It's got all these parameters. God knows what, you know. Well, I just wanted to mention that Frank Pasquale, a legal scholar, has written a very interesting book called The Black Box Society. Right. And, it, and that the book leads to the deep learning that we're kind of talking about here. So 
But what this points out, though, is you need to have humans looking at the decisions constantly and trying to ask, is this what we want? Because we can't quantify the utility function of humanity. What, how we feel, how we respond in the long time, is this what we want? And that means what we have to look at is what our, our machines are doing. And we have to be in control of them. And so it turns out it's not too hard to build systems like that. You just have to realize that you don't want them running you. You want to have them helping us and being under our control. Exactly. There's, there's a, the yeah. individual being a first party in the conversation exactly. yeah. is important to the four corners of a contract. Exactly. So what's clear is this new thing you're contemplating, algo logarithm, which will replace the law. Good idea. Seems to me you need to extend it so that penalty and uh, what's the word? Punishment? Incentive? Penalties and uh, as it were, needs to be computed as well. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? The question is that in the discussion of the contract, he wants to look at the penalty and punishment, the cost. That how, how do L with apologies to Gilbert and Sullivan fans, how does the punishment fit the crime? How do the algorithms, the punishment algorithms, what's the impedance match with the decision? So is that a fair characterization? Good. So, so one of the reasons that I'm talking with the ABA is that it's occurred to people that law is too complicated to understand. And, um, you know, so you get, I, I work with some people out at MITRE, it's up in the Boston area, they spent an incredible amount of money to figure out if you change the definition of this, what does that change throughout the government? Sometimes it's massive and completely unpredictable things. That's like a computer program where you change one variable and God knows what happened, right? And it's, it's spaghetti code. It's all like free interest and oh my God, and you can't, you know, all those bad things. And we could do a lot better with law with some design principles for how to write law in a way that's interpretable, and we get some as interesting opposed, as things. opposed to compiled, as opposed to <laughs> like completely out of control. So, so for instance, with the with the Treasury, the Office of Financial Research, which are the sort of innovation people in the Treasury, they have this long-term sort of quiet push to make it possible to evaluate financial contracts automatically. So, so from their point of view. 2007, 2008, was uh, the fact that everybody had all these contracts that said do X, Y, and Z. Nobody could know what would happen if some external circumstances, because it was just too complicated. You couldn't evaluate it. It wasn't, uh, compli wasn't complicated at all. It was, it was high, highly secretive. Also, but, but today you can't tell, like the stress testing they do, so they'll sort of openly admit it. Stress testing is BS, right? It's like, well, looks like about a 5%, right? <laughs> like that. Because you can't automatically evaluate the contracts that are being signed. So the first thing they did is they got unique identifiers for every financial actor. So that's in place. They put templates for significant financial uh, contracts. So there's only a few types of contracts, although everybody inserts a little bit at the end, just to make it interesting. But you know, you begin to come to a world where you could actually hope to understand what's happening in these legal contracts. That's the sort of vision where, God, you mean we could understand law? Wow, <laughs> as humans? Met meta tags for law. <laughs> so, so this, some of this has, has already happened in some ways. The SEC uh, um, Rosenberg, tax of Rosenberg case in 2007, uh, they had a bug, a parity error in their algorithm, a black box. Uh, it wasn't uh, told to their client for six months, so the SEC made them pay about $150 million and promised that they would verify all their code and prove it works, validating the Hawthorne theorem. And by the way, the parity error, when implemented properly, lost money. They, they were implementing a bad algorithm. By misimplementing it, they made a lot of money for their uh, clients of the hedge fund. So do you want to punish them for making more money or for not validating their 
their uh, implementation, but the implementation was wrong. So what do you want to judge them for? So, and do you want to yeah. violate computer science at the same time? So, so <laughs> I mean, another type of thing that's in the same space is I had a gentleman come to me. Uh, he uh, is in charge of auditing most of the S&P 500 tax returns. And um, it occurred to him there may be some tax changes in the next little while, right? Yeah, yeah. Like border adjustment. What would border adjustment do? Turns out nobody knows what border adjustment will do. What will be the reactions? What will it do this, what will it do that? Because nobody understands how that would percolate through all these complicated financial legal instruments. Wouldn't so, it be so nice to it, know what policy changes one of the byproducts do before you enact them? One of the byproducts of this reform, then, is the ability to model more effectively. That's right. Okay. Hi, I, uh, from America. I'd like to circle back to the privacy for a second here. Uh, um, uh, first, the, on informed consent. Most people uh, will click, I agree, but that doesn't really signify informed consent. It just signifies... No, that doesn't consent. actually count as legal. It is not informed consent because it's coerced, first of all. And the second of all, if you went and you talked to them about what did the thing you just click on say, they couldn't tell you. That, that's my point on that. So it's, it's not consent and it's not informed. Other than that, it's perfect. Okay. Other than that, it's perfect. Second, second, point, second point, just to continue, is that um, when I hear big data and privacy in the same sentence, they are diametrically opposed in my mind, that you can't have privacy. But they shouldn't be. I know they shouldn't be. I, I understand your ideals and where you're getting through. I'm talking about real world. How no, I'm talking, I'm, 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 I, 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 want, I want babies to not die but unnecessarily. I, I agree, I, so I want those two things together. I agree on, but but right? at the same time, though, uh, what I'm getting at is where there is big data, there are systems, and where there are systems, there are devices that access those systems. And when we have so many vulnerabilities and exploits going on, uh, there's a lot of data exfiltration. I mean, just look in the news every day besides... What's, the, what's, what's the question there? Uh, well, um, we well can't, I can how tell. do we have privacy when we don't have device security? And, and okay, so, security? so it turns out that private, I, mean, I agree with you in the following sense. Privacy is only one side of security, and security is privacy. Privacy is security of your data. Security in general is security of everybody's data. We don't have that, and the reason we don't have it is that the architecture for computing and data that we use today was the one that was appropriate in 1965. And we haven't sort of figured out that we've got a network now and it's all like really different. So I'll advertise our book, my book, so called well, Trust we colon colon, colon data. Blockchain will do it. No, 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 no. It's, actually, it's actually, we have a system called Enigma. It uses secure multi-party computation with blockchain. See, on top. And then there's cherries in the corner. Yeah, okay. And <laughs> no, your, your question, sir. No, 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 sir. Go ahead. No, no, no. Wait, I, I have a quick question. So, so, and I am a lawyer, so I have to still have that. Good. So it sounds to me like what you're proposing is instead of having conflations of law, is you would have an open ended law system that would be based on, a, on contract, on algorithmic contracts. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're proposing? So well, you uh, I mean, so there's a lot of different ways to realize this. My personal favorite is the sort of open-ended, it's essentially a common law uh, framework where it's based on algorithmic contracts that are continually uh, re-evaluated in the way that common law is, right? So what that does is that gives you uh, the opportunity of making a data-driven, results-driven, reality-driven evolution of law over time. So, so the normative social consensus ends up happening when you, first of all, create new, uh, if it's pure common law, you don't have, um, you know, just general rules, right? It's just examples. But let's imagine that it's a mixed system, which is far more likely. So, so you have humans creating rules which should enunciate the values and the norms, and then you have algorithms that are written and execute, and then you have humans evaluating the execution and asking, is that really satisfy the intended norms or not? And if it doesn't, then it goes back and it gets rewritten. 
Do you and that's the type of thing that we have set up in this open algorithm. Loop. It's very, very simple at this point. But the point is, is, is that you want to have efficient access to enforcement of norms, essentially common let me, law. Let me cheat your question, and if you'll excuse the expression, find the loophole in this. Why wouldn't the open, if I wanted to beta your approach, which mm -hmm. is a legitimate, clearly a legitimate approach, why wouldn't I pick a regulatory agency as opposed to a law, you know, we're going through the legislative process with all these kinds of reconciliation, et cetera. Why wouldn't I treat the SEC or the FTC or the European uh, Competitive Commission uh, as, a, as a beta site for algorithmic regulation to give us insights because they're administrative judges, et cetera, as a, as a, as a trial run, again, forgive the metaphor. So, so it's fundamentally political. Okay. So, so the people, we, we propose this to many people. The people that are willing to give it a shot, right, are people who have no system at all at the moment, pick Senegal, people who have a civil war that's still active, Colombia, uh, a country like Andorra, which has 80,000 citizens and is really hurting economically, and no real infrastructure, um, and feels like they need to do something better. <laughs> and that their people can't do it, step up on their own. They need that right. resource. And in China, it's different, because they have this evolution problem where, you know, they had, they had the Communist Party, they then decided that getting rich is good, they incorporated the rich people into the party, but 80% of the people don't live where there's any jobs and talk about inequality. And they're very worried about a um, very different sort of inclusiveness than we worry about in this country. But, you know, and so, so they would like fairness to be visible, whatever that means to them, because it's not my country, right? You know, they get to decide. But they want it to have visible. And, and they also want the people to have access, because one of the big problems there that we have too, right, is access to law. I have, in my life, been wronged many times when I should have had recourse to law, to the courts, but I can't afford it. You know, I th personally, I feel like unless you are in the $100 million category, you have no access to law. That's just the reality. I, I thought your companies were doing better. <laughs> nah, sorry. It's all illiquid. It's like, yeah. You know. <laughs> last, last question over here. No, Chris is, sir. Talking largely about technological solutions, but the question I'd like to ask drives at, those are, is that just a tool? Do we really need the, do we really need, thank you, the political will? Do we need the fact that the data is collected? Certainly in this country, you talk about the difference between this country and the European Union by people who have very large amounts of capital and access to the legal system and benefit from the data. So yeah, they're, they're not likely to give up and say, okay, you can have control of your data back. Um, and that's something that's applying to much wider fields than uh, privacy. Uh, my own particular interests are Check 2000, if you're familiar with it, which made things very convenient for the banks, but it's remarkably easy to forge a check now. Or the way digital signatures are implemented, which means any six-year-old who can type my initials can sign a document if he's got access to my computer. So the, the balance between what we can do technologically and what still has to be done socially and within you know, the existing non-technical legal system. Well. So complicated. <laughs> um, I see, I guess, sort of two types of things. One is is that we've become a very segregated society along lines of wealth. And a lot of the last things in the last election uh, are due to the fact that poor people and rich people don't talk to each other. It's a very different world in different parts of America. That's one sort of aspect. With respect to the sort of power thing, right? Um, 
You know, in the privacy world, I think that, you know, we're, we're in a hard place. Uh, but we have big things like banks and so forth that would like to get into the data game, but they're heavily regulated. And so we have a little bit of leverage over them. Um, and we had a little bit of a conversation earlier about how do we actually push a more sensible agenda forward? And it's hard because of these sort of concentrations of power, because of lack of understanding. Um, and I don't really have a great solution to it, except that um, I think there are ways to leverage the system to get better solutions uh, than we have now. I am not a big, personally, a big believer in normal sort of political solutions. I think they don't, I think they get co-opted too easily. Um, I, I'm a big believer in trying to find win-win-win solutions. So for instance, the stuff that I did at Davos in, required these big companies to give up control of data. But in return, they got something. They got to be the future of a healthy data ecosystem, whereas otherwise they had no data at all, no ability to use it. What the government got was the ability to deliver better services and to look like a hero on the issue of privacy. That was particularly in the EU. What the citizens get are more privacy and better services. None of it's perfect, right? So not letting the good get in the way of the, the excellent get in the way of the good, rather. So it's, you know, I don't know that there's a great solution. I'm sorry. Great getting in the way of the non-existent. Yeah, right, okay, right, yeah. Okay. So I, I wanted to thank our speakers. I wanted to insert one question because um, you know, we, as we wrap up, in the financial world, I'm mean, a big blockchain uh, fan myself, and uh, they originally started with the idea that blockchain was going to give complete transparency, and then they all got together in these consortiums and realized, well, wait a second, we can't provide that. And so what's happened is they've come up with these hybrid ledgers that are not necessarily sharing all the information. I mean, do you see that as evolving as well in the healthcare space as a mechanism to actually allow people to feel comfortable with what they share and what, the, what is visible? Well, healthcare is one of these really tough areas. So for instance, in the Obama uh, administration, we had our country's first chief data scientist, and his main task was trying to get data sharing in the health industry. Uh, brilliant guy, a lot of power behind them. I don't think anything happened. Wow. Uh, and, and the reason is it's not in the interest of most of the major stakeholders in the existing system to do anything. I mean, it's really simple to sort of uh, discover this. It's things like, you know, where does your hospital rank against other hospitals? Do you know? No. How about your doctor? No. Why don't you know? Those are simple things to compute. Right? Oh, well, it's not in their interest to have that widely and computed, right? I would also add that it brings us full circle to the point of informed consent. If you don't know those things, we're yeah. impossible, right? Yeah. That's so it's really screwy. And as I was saying earlier before this, I think the only way to solve those sorts of problems is you have to go out the, outside of the current formulation. So you have to deal with health, not health care, right? Maybe we can get a really good start on health and then absorb the healthcare system, you know, by uh, pure overwhelming efforts. <laughs> and maybe there are other ways to do it. Um, it's not easy. Well, thank you so much, yeah. uh, Sandy. We're, we're, uh, Sandy will be around for our questions. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Michael, as well. And thank you to guests for hosting us.